Now, also, I'm not going to lose games deliberately, so I'm going to, like, rise quickly through the ranks. So I'm going to reach, like, a 1,000 really quickly, and that's going to be part of the plan. So I won't play too many games against total beginners so that I don't get too bogged down. Um, hopefully that's a fair compromise. And pretty soon I'm going to be at a decent level where I can start talking about openings more theoretically. Okay, Shivam Chauhan 2. All right. So to remind people, I'm playing. Okay, <laughs> I'm playing my official opening recommendations in the speed run, and when we get a little bit higher rated, we're actually going to face like main lines, and that's when I'll try to start talk about theory, and I'll use every game to advance your theoretical knowledge and your conceptual knowledge. Now, these first couple of games, we're obviously going to encounter these sidelines and these like frivolous moves, but they're not totally frivolous. They're like serious moves at a beginner level. And they're moves that scare a lot of people away. So the important thing to do is not to just laugh and say, oh, this move's terrible. Ikara Nakamura played Queen H5, actually, in classical games. It's it's it's, it's a real move, and you, you actually need to know how to punish it. Coincidentally, I've looked at it, so I know what the best move here is. So the best move you, you might think is like D6 or, or E6 to defend the C5 pawn, but Queen H5 doesn't actually protect the E4 pawn. So the best move here is just to develop as if nothing is happening. And of course, the queen on h5 is very vulnerable to an attack. So putting all of that together, the best move here is knight f6. Yeah, this is what I think Volo Keaton played against Hikaru when Hikaru played queen h5. Now, famously, Hikaru played queen h5 against e5, and it's not such a bad move. Against c5, he also has played it in classical chess. He had a phase where he was doing this. Okay, queen c5, obviously, we played knight e4. And we've traded the e pawn for the c pawn, but also white has not developed any pieces other than his queen. And now our strategy is just going to be to develop quickly and occupy our, our center with pawns, like the literal most basic stuff that we do in any position. So I'm already looking at the move d5, knight c6, e5. Like it depends on where white puts his queen. Like if the queen drops back to e3, for example, we would play d5. If the queen was back to h5. Um, okay, interesting move. Not particularly bad. And you might be very tempted to play g6 here. Let's chase the queen away and let's prepare to fianchetto the bishop. g6 is not a bad move. So g6 white can swing the queen over to e5, ostensibly forking the knight and the rook. But the knight can drop back to f6 and cover that diagonal. So that's actually a totally legitimate way to play. In fact, we might play g6. We can also just continue our development. We can play knight c6. And you might say, but what if white chases away the knight with d3? Well, so be it. The knight's just going to drop back to f6 and attack the queen again. So let's actually play it in the simplest possible way. We're just going to go knight c6. And if, yeah, okay, bishop c4, obviously threatening mate. So we want to be careful. Okay, don't go d6. That doesn't defend the f7 pawn. Don't go d5 because there's two attackers on d5 and only one defender. White can take that. So what's the best way to defend against mate here? There's two two good moves here, I would say. One one is more consistent with our strategy. Yeah, e6 is good. Because e6 also prepares to build up a very nice pawn center with d5. Like this, this structure, f7, e6, d5, is very solid. Even though I just mentioned that we would love to play d5 and e5, that's not the only valid way to control the center. e6, d5 is also perfectly rock solid and sufficient. Okay, let's see what um, our opponent brings to the table here. If I were playing white, I would probably play a move like knight c3 or, or d3. Yeah, there's a, a clear drawback of the move e6, which is that it blocks in the light squared bishop. Like once we play d5, the bishop is going to be staring at a pawn. Again, I have no answer to that point because it's it's a real point yeah the bishop might be a little bit more passive the only thing i ever say to that always is like not every piece needs to be flying through frankfurt airport distributing the covid vaccine like etc and this is a great application of it it's such a ubiquitous phrase because it, it's so true in so many different types of positions so here like it's okay to put one of your pieces on d7 it's not gonna change the fabric of the position yeah d5 is a great move defends and attacks Defends and attacks. 
And then the bishop, light, uh, dark squared bishop could come out to c5, attacking the f2 pawn, forcing this awkward developing move knight h2. Bishop b5. This is not a pin that we are fearing at all. This is a totally innocuous pin. White has no way to apply pressure on the knight. And as I've mentioned before, an easy way to determine whether a pin is dangerous, well, there's sort of a two-step process. You can say, one, is the pinned piece protected by a pawn? If the answer is yes, chances are the pin is already much less dangerous. Then second question, is the pin likely to be temporary? The answer is also yes, because once we castle kingside, it gets rid of the pin naturally, which means we don't really need to play bishop d7. We don't really need to play a6 here. We can just continue developing according to our plan. We can play bishop c5, attack f2. Then we can castle kingside, and that frees up the knight. The knight can jump into d4. That's a fork against the queen and bishop, kind of re repurposing the pin to our favor. Thank you everybody for the subs. Appreciate it. Is queen b6 ever an idea? Yeah, I mean, obviously. Qu queen b6 is generally a, uh, a good move in a lot of different types of positions, especially here. Just attack the bishop, put pressure on f2. Yeah, our opponent is, is finding the moves. But castling is more flexible. Right now we're keeping our options open. We're unpinning the knight. And remember that queen b6 threatens the bishop, but the f2 pawn is rather well defended by white so you this is not the only thing we should attack okay d3 okay so that's probably that, that's a mistake that's a, a blunder's material um why is it blunder material well now we have a move that i've already mentioned it's a very strong move obviously this queen on f3 is incredibly vulnerable so you should always be thinking about ways that you can attack it now there's two concrete ways that we can attack the queen we can play knight to e5 Okay, but then the queen just drops back. That doesn't create a second threat. Knight d4 is much better because it also threatens the bishop. Now you might say, okay, I get it. We play knight d4, we attack the queen. The queen drops back. Sorry, knight d4, the queen drops back. We take his bishop, but then he takes our knight. Like, what, what do we gain from that trade? Well, it's not that simple. Let's, let's start by playing knight d4, and then after the queen drops back to d1, I'm assuming otherwise the c2 pawn hangs with a fork. We have a strong move in that position. Yeah, we also create a third threat, which I forgot to mention initially. Knight takes c2, obviously. Queen a5 was also quite decent. I'll show after the game why I like it a little bit less, but it's also actually achieves a very similar thing to knight d4. So maybe even it is more accurate. I don't know. No, queen a5 was a totally legitimate alternative. And it worked much the same night. Okay, so yeah, so that's the problem with these games is that like if, at some point, like at some point, just just these players they actually find some pretty good moves. Like you can see here, White was playing pretty good chess, like Bishop c4, Queen back to f3, Bishop b5, Knight h3 was found, only move defending the pawn. But then like at some point, there's just a collapse. And, and and they just get overwhelmed with... And I think this happens when people get overwhelmed with threats. Like, they see three or four threats, and, and they're just mind turns into mush. Okay, that's an underwhelming game, for sure. But still, that's just going to be the first couple of games. We Look, we're already 700, so you won't have to wait long for us to cross 1,000, and then we'll get more serious games. Um, but the game was won a little bit earlier than that. Yeah, so queen h5, knight f6. Queen takes c5, knight takes c4. I forget how the Hikaru game went. I think Hikaru took on c5. Apparently Richard Report also played this. Of course, this is total garbage. Like, this is like, black is already clearly better, I think. And white has to be accurate in order to avoid basically being lost. Um, yeah, I was reading a really interesting article today on, like... Okay, so there's this chess historian named Edward Winter. If you're watching on YouTube, I highly recommend you check out his work. He has a website called chessnotes. Or is it called chesshistory.com? Where he basically posts articles on a bunch of different like chess topics. Let me check, actually. Yeah, it's chesshistory.com. Good domain name. And he's like very, very biting in his reports like he writes about really bad books and like one of his articles is about 
chess annotations, like how, how games are annotated. And he basically says that chess players are known for like using cliches constantly when they're annotating their games. Um, but he, he, he gave a couple of examples of like really good comments. And one of them was missing an opportunity to resign. <laughs> that was Tarnikauer, I think, invented that. Missing a good opportunity to resign at some point, if one side is prolonging the game. So anyways, um, queen h5, we go knight c6, we continue our development. In bishop c4, this threatens checkmate in one. This is a pattern you should be able to quickly identify if you are a, even if you're a beginner. This is like the classic, the queen from f3 or h5 attacks f7, so does the bishop. So we just go e6. And really, the, the, main, the only conceptual challenge of this entire game was to convince ourselves that it's not the end of the world, that the light squared bishop is going to be somewhat confined by the pawns. Thank you, Ghost Freak, for the sub. So that's literally it. Once you realize that it's okay, all of the moves become supernatural. Bishop c5, then we castle, we free up the knight, the knight jumps into d4. What would we have done if white had dropped the queen back to d1? So there's two options here. The easy option is to play just knight takes b5, d e4, and then we just play d e4, and we say we're up a pawn. We've got better development, two bishops, the knight's crappy on h3, black is much better. Okay, the queen's going to be traded, but that doesn't change the, the nature of the position. Black is like borderline winning here. The second option, a little bit more convoluted, is to say, well, two pieces are hanging at the same time, knight and bishop. I've talked about this scenario at length, and one of the first things you should search for is whether there is a way to whether there's a way to um, to give away one of the pieces for a certain amount of material, such as a pawn, and then to take the other piece. This is a desperado sacrifice. The logic is like you're already losing the knight on e4. You might as well give it away for like the maximum amount of material. Once you phrase it that way, the move should be really easy. Yeah, knight takes f2. So you. It's not a sacrifice. Right? You're taking the bishop on the next move. And so what if the bishop moves? Well, the bishop can't move because the queen, this move also attacks the queen. So in a way, this is almost a check. You're forcing white to take. Then you take the bishop, and you've removed the f2 pawn from the board, permanently weakening white's king side. Okay, white can castle still, but then we can maybe play the move e5, occupying the center with pawns. The bishop is strong. The other bishop is good as well. Now, this is like, yeah, queen h4 is good. This is just really, really bad for white. But obviously, knight a3, knight f3 is just game. Yeah, that's just game. And uh, I'm probably going to combine this with another YouTube, with, with another speedrun game that I'll do tomorrow. The emphasis in this speedrun is on openings. I'm playing and presenting my recommended opening repertoire with both colors. And as we climb the rating ladder, uh, we will be spending more time talking about theory and talking about uh, basic opening ideas. Now. I just ask that people understand that what's a sweet spot for you might not be a sweet spot for somebody else. So people leaving comments and saying, oh, you know, this is too basic for me. Well, put yourself in the shoes of someone who's a beginner and who benefits from that content. And I'm trying to, like, please as many people as possible. But that obviously at all times, it's going to be too basic for someone and it's going to be too advanced for other for another person. So just understand that I'm like I'm doing my best. Um, and it's it's impossible to generate content that is truly appealing to every single level at the same time. And we're playing hand shaitans. Let's play e4. Let's play e4. d5. So we are facing a scandy. Obviously, we take on d5. That's the line. Yeah, we're facing a scandy, which is definitely a pretty rare guest at, at like the level of 700, 800. Um, now, of course, if you've seen previous speedrun games, we face the Scandi quite a bit. And there are a couple of ways to play it from this position. You can play the move d4 to occupy the center. That's a viable possibility. Even the move knight f3. Nothing wrong with that. But the, the topical move, the principled move, is, of course, knight c3 developing with tempo attacking the queen. This move makes by far the most logical sense of all of White's moves. And this speaks to why the Scandi is an unsound opening fundamentally, Black is uh, eschewing all of his minor piece development and instead moving the queen around a bunch in the opening. Queen e6 check. So what's funny is that this, this move, uh, it, it's a move that beginners often like to make because beginners like to give checks. And obviously it's a bad move, 
but it's been played like recently. It's, it, it has been played by some by some GMs, and Black does have a way to try to make this move work at like a high level. But obviously at this level, most people don't play this move because they have in mind like a, a deep preparation or something like that. So how should we block the check? Well, you could make a case for knight g2, but the straightforward move, of course, is bishop e2. Because you could argue that knight g2 blocks the development of the f1 bishop. Now, in situations where you've blocked the development of the bishop, always remember that you can fee and keto the bishop. You can play knight g2, and then you can play g3, bishop g2. So all of the pieces are going to be happy. But in this particular instance, we're going to play it simple. We're just going to play bishop e2. And then we're going to play knight f3. And we're going to play d4 at some point to occupy the center. When should you play d4? Yeah, you can play d4 like as soon as you complete your minor piece development. So the move, as far as I remember, uh, that, that like the high-level people play is queen g6. Yeah, queen g6 is like the, you know, the, the move you're supposed to play. Our opponent plays bishop d7. Okay, so we're going to continue our development with knight f3. And our next couple of moves are going to be d4, castles, kingside. And at some point when we complete our development, we can start targeting black's incredibly vulnerable queen on e6, which is like standing in the middle of everything and not allowing black uh, to properly develop his or her pieces. Thank you, Big Stink Daddy, for the sub. So it should sort of make sense to you as you're watching this why black's play is incredibly dubious. Like, moving the queen this many times, giving your opponent a huge lead in development and central control, is going to cost black very dearly, and it's going to cost black quickly. So, my guess is that with the, with his last move, bishop d7, our opponent maybe wants to go knight c6 and then castles queenside. But we're not even going to allow black the possibility to do that. Because in response to knight c6, we're just going to push d4 straight away. Because that is going to threaten a fork, d4 to d5, and forking the queen and the knight. So this is, okay, h6. So our opponent continues to sort of move random pieces, allowing us to increase our lead in development. Let's castle kingside. We also could have started with d4. It really does not matter. In many instances, like d4, castles kingside, we can make any developing move that we want, and all of it is going to be good. This is honestly a, a terrible, terrible position for black. I would go so far as to say that, I would go so far as to say that black is borderline losing here. Just because our lead in development is so overwhelming. Okay, so knight c6 has been played. As you can see, these two pieces are on forkable squares. How do I know that? Well, I know that because if a pawn appears on d5, it'll be forking the queen and the knight. So what's our move? Our move is obviously d4, which is what we wanted to play anyway. But now this move is especially potent because we're threatening to fork the queen and the knight with d5. Does that make sense? So d5 is now a huge threat. And it's actually not such an easy threat to deal with. Because the black queen... This is the danger of putting your queen in front of all of the pieces. The queen has simply no good squares. If black shifts the queen over to d6, which may seem like the best way to defend against the fork, who can tell me why queen d6 loses on the spot? Why does the move queen d6 lose? Yeah, knight b5 is just game over. Very good. Knight b5 attacks the queen, forces it away, and then we win c7 with a fork against the rook and the king. Now you could say, well, okay, but the queen can go, let's say, to g6. But if the queen goes to g6, we can continue pushing our d-pawn, dislodging the knight away from c6, and black is just, we're just going to start rocking the ramp, storming the barricades after knight e5. And, and we're just pouncing on black, given the fact that his entire king side is totally undeveloped. So this game is already like a lesson in the importance of healthy development in the opening. So we're waiting on our opponent to make a move. Black's position. Okay, knight takes e4. And this is like what I've been talking about a lot, which is that, you know, at this beginner level, like when beginners are faced with like serious problems, generally, you know, they just like collapse completely, which is totally like, okay. And I'm not saying this to embarrass anybody, uh, but this is a good example of that. Obviously, knight takes d4 just gives up a piece. And we can take either way. Knight takes d4 is, I think, what most people would play. I really like the move queen takes d4 because it gets the queen out into the center and prepares stuff like knight d5. So I think that the fastest path to victory, if we want to win this game quickly, is, is probably actually queen takes d4. There's another reason I like queen takes d4, which is that it, it prevents black from castling queenside, because it, it aims at the a7 pawn. 
So in the event of castles queenside, we play queen takes a7. But I really like the placement of the queen on d4 because it is essentially unassailable. Black has no pieces with which to attack the queen. c5, okay, Kathy, there we go. See, it works like a charm. Queen takes a7, the game is over. Now we're threatening checkmate in one. Notice that our bishop is guarding the a6 square. c6, okay, now let's be precise, right? A lot of people in these types of situations, they tend to start playing quickly. We have many ways that we can win. But if we want to deliver checkmate as quickly as possible, what should we start with? You'll notice that queen a8 is not checkmate because of king c7. So one way to win, one way to win would be to give the check on a8 and then give the check on f4, force the king out to b6 and then capture the rook on d8. That's totally winning. But even faster is to play bishop f4 first to cover the c7 square and threaten checkmates on a8 and on b8. Black's king is now totally... To I think Black's best move is actually to play queen d6 and give up an entire queen. Easy game, but if you're like 700 or 800 and you're watching this video, you know, you should realize that you can you can go a long way just by playing like natural moves in the opening. Like all we did was develop our pieces. That's literally all we did. Literally all we did. Uh, and and it, it resulted in like a 10 move victory. So already d5 is a very bad move at a beginner level. Like I never recommend the Scandi to players period, but especially not to players under like 17, 1800, give or take. Um, and the reason is this is something I've spoken to a lot in previous speedruns is that when you're a beginner, you want to, you basically, you want to play openings that allow you to put into practice like basic opening principles, right? Because you're a beginner, you've just learned basic principles. And then if you play an opening like the Scandi, all you're doing is you're violating those principles. So you're creating kind of like cognitive dissonance in your mind, which is why like I very strongly recommend beginners to play sound, healthy openings like E4, E5, or even the Sicilian. My official recommendation in the speedrun is the Accelerated Dragon, which we haven't had a chance to play yet. So after, I think, BBB for the 49 months. So after we trade, Knight C3, of course, Queen E6 check is the wrong move. Uh, the main line is Queen A5. Although there have been a couple of sidelines that have gotten popular in recent years, queen d6 is a super topical line. And even queen back to d8 has been recommended by some authors. I think John Bartholomew recommends queen d8 in a chessable course. Not an easy move to prove an advantage against, actually. So queen e6 check just allows white to continue his development. And here black makes the serious mistake with bishop d7. The only way to try to make this line work is actually to move the queen again, queen g6 attacking the pawn on g2, and the point is to put the queen on a relatively invulnerable square. So how should white defend g2? Should we play the move g3? Or does white have a better way to defend the g2 pawn? It's an inaccuracy. It's, queen e6 is definitely not a blunder. A blunder is something that like hangs a piece. Yeah, bishop f3. Okay, so all you guys know this idea. You put the bishop on a good square. You definitely don't want to avoid... You, you definitely want to avoid a move like g3, which creates unnecessary weaknesses on the king side so the move is definitely bishop f3 knight f6 and for example knight g2 and then the knight can go to f4 the pawn goes to d4 and obviously white is 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 quite a bit better here but still this is the only way to try to make this work after bishop d7 knight f3 already black is in serious trouble h6 castles okay knight c6 and after d4 as i said black is borderline lost queen d6 loses to knight b5 as we discussed I think the only way to prolong the game for black was probably something like queen g6. But here we can still play d5. We can also play a simple developing move like bishop f4 targeting the c7 pawn. We're totally spoiled for choice here. But the way I would play it is d5. And if black plays knight b4, I think we have a pretty instructive sequence. So here we can play the move knight f3 to e5. Totally natural move hitting the queen, hitting the bishop. But it may seem like a blunder due to queen takes c2. And here, if you look carefully, you will see that white has a very, very powerful response. Who can find it? What should white do? So we know that we want to avoid a queen trade. Because in the event of a queen trade, your ability to conduct the initiative and just the overall effect of your development advantage greatly diminishes. So, okay, but 
Think about how white can avoid the queen trade. Yeah, very good. You can just move the queen out of the way to d4. Queen d4 is a super powerful move because not only does it avoid a queen trade, it also attacks the knight on b4. It comes with tempo. And remember, you also have this threat of taking the bishop on d7, driving black's king out of the shell. After queen d4, white is already totally winning. Like, totally winning. And in addition to all of that, you can also play the move bishop d3, trapping the queen on c2 and winning the queen. If c5, then you have on passant. So this is just game over straight away. Yeah, there is a way to trap the black queen. Black cannot keep the knight on b4. If black plays e6, then the simplest is just to play knight takes d7 and de check and drives the king out of its shell. And this is going to be checkmate in a couple of moves. So all very, very simple stuff. But obviously after knight d4, queen d4, the game ends immediately. We're just up a piece and we're driving our knight into d5. The bishop's coming out to c4. This is all very, very straightforward. Queen takes a7, threatens checkmate. And then bishop f4 deprives the king of its only escape square. And here black resigned. So, so far, you know, the speedrun games might seem overwhelming. But again, we're laying the groundwork. We're playing basic moves. And these basic moves are allowing us to win all of our games quickly. When we hit the level of like 1,000, you're going to find that the games start getting a little bit juicier. But I think it's important for us to lay this groundwork so that we can benefit more from the more complex discussions that we're going to have at, when we climb. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I have to get going. All right. Thank you all. And see you later.